Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Mystery Vault podcast. I'm your host, RJ McCready, and for this episode, we're going to be taking a look at the mysterious case of the Philadelphia experiment. Now, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this case. It's the it's a pretty cool one, actually. It's a, a, a United States warship that was rendered invisible for an experiment that, to this day, the United States Navy deny. And what we're going to do today is have a look into that case because um, I'm familiar with it. And the way I was familiar with this case was through Hollywood, actually. Um, I watched the movie that came out in 1984. It's not a bad film. It's actually supposed to be directed by John Carpenter, but he turned it down. I knew I was going to get John Carpenter um quoted onto this show because I'm the biggest John Carpenter fan in the world but I'll leave that for my other show which is Bite Size Cinema Podcast but I'm not going to be talking about that today we're talking about the disappearance of this ship because some people are saying that it's not just a Hollywood movie this is actual fact which is interesting um, and to be honest with you I've never really looked into the case up until now for this um, you know for, the, for my podcast I've always I've always been aware of it um, I've seen it again as I said in the other episodes that you get the uh, coffee table um, analysis of this you know where they say that this is the ship it disappeared this is what's supposed to have happened but when I've looked into a little bit more detail it's actually quite a fascinating case when uh, you you realize where this actually is came from and the the origins of this story which uh, goes off into all different directions including aliens funny enough and as I said before aliens always come into it in one way or the other, another in uh, the mystery world so what I'm going to do is um, I'm just going to turn the clock back and I'm just going to do this episode in a way of a type of building block so you sort of build the picture up and uh, put a few facts on the table and then as always I'll tell you what I think of what I think it has happened in this case in the end so let's go back to 1943 and as you guys know in in that time the world was at war um, with uh, Germany and Japan and the United States was one of the biggest fists in um, helping helping out the allies in Europe to uh, fight the uh, the Nazi regime and in order to do this, what they were doing was uh, helping with supplies and also preparing for the invasion of Europe, which would be D-Day. And they were crossing the Atlantic and the merchant ships were getting taken out by uh, Nazi U-boats. Um, so what they were doing was sending in these destroyer ships, which uh, one of them being the USS Eldridge, which is involved in this case today. And what the US Navy was looking at was that the ships were getting taken out by the U-boats. The U-boats kind of had an upper hand, so they were upgrading naval destroyers all the time. Now some of the basic upgrades would be faster power in the engines um, to give them quicker maneuverability and also um, they made them a little bit smaller to give them better turning circles to avoid um, torpedoes. And they had all the best engineers and scientists trying to help them out, to try and give them that upper hand. One of those scientists was Albert Einstein, and and his involvement in this case is actually one of the important details when you look into the uh, mystery of the Philadelphia experiment. But before, before I talk a little bit more about that, I will just continue with um, this building block. So what I'll move on to now is the actual ship itself, the USS Eldridge. It was built in 1943. And she was classed as a cannon destroyer. She was about 300 foot long. And as I said, she served in the Atlantic, uh, escorting supplies, spent time in the Mediterranean, North Africa, um, went over to the Pacific, fought in the uh, Pacific campaign against the Japanese, uh, mainly in Okinawa. And then in 1951, uh, transferred to Greece, the uh, Greek Navy, and was renamed as the Leon. Um, and then decommissioned in 1992 and then eventually scrapped in 1999. So on the whole, the Eldridge managed to get through the, the war campaign unscathed. She helped out. And I guess there was a part where you could say that this ship was like any other ship in the Navy that was doing its part in World War II. But 
But it wasn't until after war until this story came to light and it came to the attention of Morris K. Jessup who is a author of The Unexplained. Basically Morris K. Jessup is the guy who is a bit like, I suppose he's a bit like the Fox Mulder of today. Um, he's in, really interested in the unexplained, he's questioning UFOs, the uh, Naval or the United States Air Force involved in that because in this time period in 1950s, in pop culture you had flying saucers, you had movies like Earth versus the Flying Saucers, you had all the mysteries, you had the Roswell stuff which I've mentioned in previous episodes. And Jessup was questioning this, he was really interested in it. And he had recently published a book at this time called The Case for UFO. And this book was kind of like a game changer in the unexplained world at that time. And he was basically questioning the uh, USA Navy and the government's involvement in possible UFOs and the sightings. And the other thing you got to remember here in this time period is that it was a kind of like a... It was a tough time for anybody to believe in this because the government was rejecting these claims and the Navy. And you had uh, Project Blue Book. You also had the Men in Black. Uh, you had all those types of cases. So he was kind of, I guess you could say he was kind of in dodgy territory if someone was questioning this back in that time. And then you also had everybody that was interested in it as well, as I mentioned, in popular culture. He then receives two letters from a person called Carlos Miguel Allende and in this letter he is claimed to have witnessed a secret World War II experiment um, involving the USS Eldridge disappearance. He's basically saying in this letter that I have seen a naval warship disappear and he went into detail and he said that it, it became invisible and it got covered in a green fog and he was saying that it reappeared somewhere else in Norfolk, Virginia, 200 miles from the naval dockyard in Philadelphia. And he was saying that the crew had side effects, some of them vanished. He was saying some of them were fused into the actual ship itself, which is quite disgusting. And he also said that this ship got teleported into different dimensions. He said that there was aliens that were involved in it. it involved time travel it went back and forth and it was a very elaborate story so by the end of Jessup reading this letter he just I think he pretty much crunched it up and just dismissed it and he just thought this is just a phony story I just don't believe it I think it's just someone there's just someone who's writing me a letter because they like my book and I'm just gonna you know dismiss it But what's important about this letter and me doing some research into this case is it's the first time here where we've heard about the actual Eldridge disappearing. Then a little while later, uh, Jessup gets a knock on the door from the Office of Naval Research and some of the officials and they're called the ONR. And they said they received a package from an anonymous person and the package all it said and it was Happy Easter and when I opened it up it had Jessup's book in it the, the UFO book but the pages contains um, writing on the pages which explained all sorts of theories about again aliens, time travel uh, different dimensions all that sort of stuff but within that again it was the case of the Philadelphia experiment so when they approached Jessup about it they I suppose they're pointing the finger at him saying was it you that sent it to us as a as a bit of a joke or something like that Jessup's denied it but then when he's looked at the book he's looked at the handwriting and he's gone it wasn't me but I recognise that handwriting because I received a letter from this um, guy saying he was called Allende and the writing in that book is the same as on this letter so he's tied it up and he's saying that what he's claiming in this book that he's sent to the Navy is what he's told me in, in the letter. And Jessup being the person that loves a mystery, and you know, this is this is right up his streets, so suddenly his book has become a mystery itself. And he's now put put a couple of puzzle pieces together to think that there's something in this. And he's very interested in this case of this warship disappearing particularly. 
So I spent the four, next four years investigating this case and having a look into it. And in 1959, he actually came up with a conclusion. He said that he actually um, looked into it. He thinks he knows what's happened uh, with the case of the Eldridge. And he phoned up one of his friends, um, a doctor uh, called Valentine. And he said to him that I've, I've, I've got some evidence here of this case with the Eldridge. I'm going to go and um, make a call to the Navy. I'm going to go and see them about it. So this time in 1959, this would be quite exciting news coming from Jessup with his findings. But the next day on April 20th, 1959, Jessup is found dead in his car by carbon monoxide poisoning. And this was in Florida and it was um, closed as an apparent suicide. Um, he had a recent divorce and people thought he was depressed. But then there's controversy that comes in here that people think it was a cover-up because how come that he's suddenly found something with the case and then he's he's come forward, he wants to speak to people about it and then the next day he's found dead in the car mysteriously. So this is where it's gone from the author that's been told about this by somebody mysterious, he's gone to go and investigate it, the Navy have got involved and now Jessup is found dead. And as you can imagine, this case is then propelled because it's become a conspiracy itself because what did Jessup know and how come he was found dead? And it's a little bit of a strange one because, you know, he's come forward. So people have then gone on to go and investigate what Jessup's possible findings were. Um, they were trying to find um, Miguel Allende and him himself, he became a mysterious character because every time someone tried to find him, he's, his address changed. There was nothing um, on him for naval records. And it wasn't until 1969 when somebody came forward called Cole Allen. And he brought credence to the case by arriving at the Office of Naval Research with a copy of Jessup's a UFO book which contained all the extra findings in it which is a copy of the uh, book which he sent to the uh, to the Navy and he basically confessed he said that it was me um, I, I completely hoaxed it all just for a bit of fun and as it turns out in reports that Alan was actually suffering with a mental illness where he would like to make up these stories and create hoaxes but in between the time that Jessup passed away and then 1969 when uh, Carl Allen came, came forward and said it was a hoax. Again, in popular culture, people were releasing books about uh, this incident and people were starting to believe in it. And as I said before, in the mystery world, when a story comes out, people begin to look into it and think, well, is this story true? And even though Alan has come forward and said it was a hoax, um, it was the same with, as I mentioned before, with the crop circles and Roswell. Once something like this comes out, then people begin to think, well, okay, you're saying it's a hoax, but is it really? And then in 1975, there's a chap that I've mentioned before, Charles Belitz, he released the Bermuda Triangle book, which I mentioned on another show. And in that book, he's talking about vessels that disappear and one of the stories he does mention is the Philadelphia experiment and in 1975 it, it again this story just went boom people were looking into it and thinking wow uh, a naval warship you know disappearing that's pretty cool and people were starting to look into this case to think well is there anything in it and Charles Blitz and William Moore took it upon themselves to do some further digging they investigated this case themselves and they put it upon themselves to go and interview the actual crew of the Eldridge. And they spoke to the captain and the crew and they came out and said, no, did we, yes, we've heard about this case, the disappearance. And they basically said, no, it's totally made up. Um, we, we've been with this ship from the start ever since it was constructed because there were some theories that um, this experiment took place before the actual ship got commissioned into service so they're saying that it was actually a skeleton crew that got picked for the experiment and then it got all hushed up and then it got commissioned 
and then it had its new crew with the captain. But the captain saying no, it's um, the the crew that were with this ship were with it, with the ship since it was uh, constructed, being the engineers, so they knew every single nut and butt of the ship before its active service in the war campaign. So up until this point with the investigation, you could just say, right, okay, so the captain said that this didn't happen and we're at this point now where we're going to say, right, so how could this have happened? Let's just say if what eyewitnesses did see this ship disappear or somebody's come out and said that the Eldridge, you know, cloaked in visibility. And... Um, I'm at that point now where I'm looking into this case and thinking, well, what, what could have happened? Now, there is a but here from the captain where he has come out and said, well, okay, well, no, it wasn't us. We didn't disappear. But what we did have was something called uh, degussing, which is a fact. And this is where Einstein came in. And he, what he did was there was the enemy, um, the Germans or the Nazis, they had technology where they were trying to get the upper hand as well, and they were creating um, mines and torpedoes which had magnetics attached to them. So they had magnets on the torpedoes which would help them go into the um, side of the ships and then blow them up. So what the US Navy was doing was getting Einstein to help them try and take away the the magnetics on the ship and it was some some pretty impressive stuff at the time and what they had on the Eldridge was some very advanced gadgets which created this uh, magnetic field to prevent magnetism and that was called the degussing and this is where the word invisible comes in because the scientists have come out and said we have created a invisible cloak against magnetism which is pretty clever itself with with the technology at this time so you could imagine all this being set up on the ship and you and remember i've said this before it's it's 19 it's the 1940s and fellow sailors are going to look at that ship from afar and sort of go wow that looks that looks advanced what are they doing there and then the sailors will go down to the bar and then they will say yeah well i've heard the scientists come out and say you know cloaks of invisibility and they're going to make the ship invisible to the enemy so you can see how these stories can get out and then you could have someone else in the bar listening to this and thinking oh the sailors have just mentioned invisibility invisibility and they're going to try and make a ship disappear that those types of stories spread out and it goes right back to like as i've mentioned with the the, the mary celeste you know old sailors towels and things like that and at that time i think uh, you know, you've got war going on and sailors are going to want to release and they want to tell these tales. So that's where I can see the invisible part coming in as a fact, but not to actually make the ship disappear itself, but to use uh, a cloak of preventing the magnet magnetism, which again, which I said, which, which is fascinating. And again, this would be top secret technology because you don't want the enemy to know that you've, you've got this um, upper hand. Then, then you've got the the part where people have said that the, the ship has disappeared. Now, there is a plausible explanation for this as well. So, in the dockyard, when ships were going out onto the east coast, uh, were being targeted by enemy submarines. So, to try and prevent this, they were using a canal, which is called the Chesapeake and Delaware Canal, um, to move the the ships to Norfolk, Virginia, which is 200 miles away, which would explain why people would say, well, I saw the ship in the Philadelphia dockyard and now it's moved to Norfolk. And again, this uh, canal was top secret, so the, the Navy was not telling anybody about this and they were secretly moving the ships on the canal. So you can see how... This could be somewhat misinterpreted from an eyewitness thinking, well, I saw it there one minute and now it's gone to a different location. And then just to back that story up slightly, you've got the sailors telling the tales of the, the the ship's invisibility cloak. And then you could have someone saying, oh yeah, well, I saw the ship in this location and now it's moved to that location and it's moving around and maybe the Navy are making invisible ships. So I can just see how these stories can escalate, but I would say... 
in a plausible way you've got the the, the gussing and the secret canal so you put those two together you can possibly see how you can make a um, a ship disappear but you know those those are the 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 facts in some or not the facts but they're there's some of the i never want to say facts because i always say well that's how it could have happened but as i've always said in these episodes but what if <laughs> okay what if it did happen you know what if the the navy did have this uh, technology and I, I even think that it it would be even today if if any navy in the world has um, an inv- invisibility device, we won't know about it. I don't think they would come out and say, "Hey, we got this," you know, because it's. And again, I don't necessarily think it's because the navy want to want to necessarily keep that information from us. But it's just the fact that you just don't want your enemy to know about that because you always want the upper hand. So it's. A hell of a fascinating story. Then on top of that, like say, um, I need to mention this as well. On top of that canal, you've got the canal, you've got the the Gussin. Then you've also got Albert Einstein down there, um, which kind of brings, you know, puts a little bit more to that ingredient. But then what I will say is, having a look at this now, this is where I was going to say this at the beginning, what I'll say it now, is invisibility. Um... Now that is something I'd look into. This something that goes right back to the Greek times. Um, so when when you sort of strip it back and you think, well, could you make something invisible? And where does invisibility come from? So I'd look at it, and it goes right back to the um, Greek times. Um, the story of Hades and Perseus, and you know the Clash of the Titans, um, where he had the invisibility cap to try and help him. You know take on Medusa and is helped by the gods so those tales go right back to the Greek times and then it moves on to like folklore tales I think it's the was it the, the druids and they had like saying they had um, invisibility cloaks and then you had H.G. Wells famous novel I think they came out in 1878 which was the invisible man which I would say at that time probably boomed, probably got people's mind thinking, oh yeah, hey, invisibility. Then in the natural world, you do have animals that disguise themselves with camouflage to, I think you've got snakes and insects, um, marine life, um, which do cloak themselves to try and prevent themselves getting attacked from the predators so yeah so in, in, invisibility is generally out there but not as a you know like a complete vanishing act but camouflage has been used and again in in the navy in you know warships airplanes so camouflage has been used so like let's take the spitfire it's got camouflage on it to you know if it crashes in the english countryside it or in parts of Europe, you could actually put it into a forest and you might be able to make it um, disappear, just say. And naval warships are generally a certain colour to try and make themselves like blend in, just say, for instance. So the, vet, the visibility technique is, is used. But then there is a theory where Einstein has, has said that one of his theories is called Unified Field Theory. And um, I've had a look into that, and it's uh, you know it's mind-boggling stuff, and it's there is like a layman's way of looking at looking at that, and it is basically a way of bending light to make something disappear. And the way of explaining it is, say you go into a room and you turn the light off, and everything becomes pitch black, and you can't see anything, and light has made at that point everything disappear because your eyes can't see it. But if you was to say, if you got a got a torch and you just say you put a cup on the floor and you got the torch and you you spotlight it, you can see the cup and nothing else. And I think what Einstein was trying to say with this theory is that what if I could reverse that process? So what if I could have the light on and then have a torch that you can then put onto that cup and then make it 
invisible with the lights on. So you're basically turning the light off on that one object and then that becomes invisible. And hopefully that's made sense to you guys. It's the only way I can sort of make sense to it myself. Um, so that's one of the one of the theories. And I suppose at the end of the day, it, it, it does make you think, well, Einstein was involved with his projects. He had that theory in his head. And it, it does make you think, okay, you know, as I said, you know, you've got the canal and you've got the, the gut in which the Navy said that's what we do with the magnetism. But, you know, it's <laughs> it's one of those things where you can say, well, did they do it or did they not? But uh, until we get some harder evidence or the Navy come forward and say, yeah, we did it, I guess it will just always be a, you know, a wonderful mystery. You know, it's, it's, it's a good mystery in, in the world. Of the unexplained, and um, you know it, this this mystery has gone into the world of Hollywood as well, where they made a movie, which I mentioned at the beginning. There was another film I forgot to mention as well, which is kind of somewhat connected to this. I want to shout it out. It's called The Final Countdown. Come out in the eighties. It's where the I think it's where the Nimitz goes back to World War Two, and it goes through like a vortex in the Bermuda Triangle or something like that. Um, so it's another case, you know, in Hollywood where a film vanishes, uh, which is a good film. Check it out before I ch um, shout that one out. But um, there you go, guys. That is it. Um, hope you enjoyed that. Hope that kind of maybe makes sense to you in some ways. Like I say, I've you know done a bit of research on it. I've just tried to sort of pull a few things out of the bag and what it could be. So um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is the Philadelphia Experiment. I hope you enjoyed that, guys. So um, there you go. I'm going to wrap the show up. But before I close up, um, as always, a little bit of admin for the show. I am a proud member of the Legion Podcast Network, so please go and check out all the other shows on there. And um, you can find uh, the Mystery Vault podcast on iTunes and Spotify and several other players on there. I've got a Facebook page where I'm most active, so you know, please put anything on there that you, um, you know, any suggestions or any other mysteries and stuff like that. Let me know. Um, be happy to have a look into that. And uh, what's coming up next? So uh, the next episode is going to be vampires, the origins of vampires. Where did they come from? When do we start talking about vampires? So uh, look out for that episode. So there you go, guys. Um, as always. Keep it spooky, keep it safe, keep it mysterious and all that sort of stuff. And look out for those vanishing warships. And see you soon. I think this is a ghost story. I think this is a ghost story. Ghost, ghost, ghost story. Because one of you, sitting here in this room, is a whale. If you enjoyed this show, then make sure you check out the other great shows on the Legion Podcast Network, like Cinema PsyOps, Cinema B, Devour the Podcast, Duncan and Bo Come Correct, Exploding Heads Horror Movie Podcast, Friday the 13th, Get Slayed, The Hell Ming Power Hour, Hello, This is the Doom Show, Hero Hero Ghost Show, Kill the Cast, Underwater Kaiju from Outer Space, Jerry Hates Action, Legion After Dark, Metal Health, Obsessive Cinema, Discourse, Pick Six Movies, The Podcast by the Cemetery, The Podcast on Haunted Hill, The Psycho Semantic Podcast, Rick Radio, House of Wax, Dude Looks Like the 80s, Rabbit and Red Radio, The Shadecast, Short Bus Cinema, Two Drink Minimum Commentaries, The VD Clinic, Who Will Survive Horror Podcast, and Which vs. the Doomsday Clock. With such a widespread of shows, there is guaranteed to be a niche for you to fall in love with. Horror, politics, movies, books, sex, music, commentaries, health, video games, kaiju, action, news, comedy, and opinions that would most likely get you killed in some parts of the world. We are proud to bring you some of the best podcasting in the world. Check us out at www.legionpodcast.com, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, YouTube, and any other dark corner of the internet where podcasts can be found. <laughs>